Hey guys, thank you for tuning in to the Risen Nation Church podcast. I pray that this message today impact your life and above all, draw you into a deeper encounter with Jesus. All right, you guys ready for the word? Turn to um, <clears throat> James chapter one. I'm not gonna tell you what verse because I don't want you to start reading. But just because we're meeting at night doesn't mean you guys have to be quiet, okay? That was not very helpful. So I need you to help me, agree with me. Amen. We're going to do this together. And this is where I feel like the Lord is really bringing us to as a body that we are, and I know I've said it before, but I, I can't feel like in 2024, the Lord is doing something new. Say amen. The Lord's doing something different. The Lord is doing in us what he hasn't done before. And it's, it's vital in this season that when, when we approach the Lord, we approach each other, that we are approaching from a place of being a priesthood, that we are not building a church. I told, I, I've said this in Chicago, I've said it in Nashville, I'll say it again here, that we are not building a church. We're not building a 501c3. We are not building an entity. We are not building a, a, even a movement, but we are assembling a priesthood. This priesthood is what bears the weight of God's body. And so for, for the body to be assembled, the priesthood must be in order. And I, this is a type of message that I would bring to our leaders. And so I'm going to invite us all into the conversation tonight. Is that okay? Because I believe, like I've had this picture in my head this week of what would it look like if everybody in a church could minister the word? What would it look like if everybody in a body of people, there wasn't just a select few and a bunch of spectators, but everybody could off, operate under the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit and the gifts that God has given them. What would the body look like? And not in chaos, in order. What would it look like? And exactly, praise God. And so, don't ruin the message. Just kidding. Adam's been hearing me for so long, he probably finish my sentences. But I, I want to talk tonight about the priesthood. And I believe we are, we are moving on from the days of pushing the glory on a cart. So how many of you remember when they, when they pushed the glory on the cart, when they pushed the ark on the cart, how many priests were pushing it? There was two. Remember, it, it almost fell and Uzzah tried to catch it. So there's two priests pushing the this cart. And I believe the days of pushing and just a few laboring to move God's glory is over. And we're pushing it. And, and as they were pushing it, it's, it's rolling through and on top of all the things of earth, slowing it down. And so it wasn't until, it doesn't say <clears throat> in Exodus or in Chronicles, how many priests held the ark. The only book in the Bible that talks about the number of priests was in Joshua when they were walking around Jericho and there was seven priests. So two that were pushing it, it turned into seven that were carrying it. Seven speaks of the fullness. We heard this. The perfection, completion. It speaks of the church. The seven golden candlesticks we're gonna see at the end. It speaks of the church of God. It speaks of the fullness of of his body. And I believe we are moving on from the days of pushing God's glory, God's presence through and mixing it with the things of this earth to become a ministry. We're, we're pushing it along. And there's a couple of people that are laboring, that are toiling, that are pushing, but God is inviting a whole priesthood to bear his presence, to bear his glory. And once we lift God's glory, there's a separation now between things of earth and things of God. There's a separation now between things of earth and the glory. Amen. And that separation is a people that stand in the gap, bearing God's glory together and not, tr not just a couple pushing it. I believe the days of ministry of one guy leading everything and everyone else just spectating and, and coming along is over. 
I said, it's over. And so it, it was a priesthood. It required the fullness of the priesthood to carry the glory. And I believe we are in this crossing the Jordan season. Remember when the priests carried the ark, the, uh, Joshua said to the people, look at the ark, look at the priests, look at the glory of God that is on the priest's shoulders. And when you see them walk into the Jordan, follow them. And remember when the priest stepped into the Jordan, the, the water separated. How many of you remember that? And so I believe we are in this day of stepping into a new season. We're in the, the time of stepping into what God has promised. And <clears throat> talking with people as a pastor, you know, you discern the, the Lord's body, the word says. And so I discern what people are going through and feeling. And what I, what I feel like is that we are entering into, and I don't know how else to say it, and I need you guys to hear with new ears tonight. Say new ears. We are entering into a passing through the Jordan into the promised land season. How that look, and this is not like a motivational message, but how that looks is I'm gonna go from a cloud by day, from following a cloud by day and fire by night. The Lord's gonna go from supplying, it, the, the word says that he held, I held your hand and walked you through the wilderness. And so in the wilderness, there's endless supply. In the wilderness, there is endless, uh, the Lord took care of them. And the Lord takes care of us, thank God, in the wilderness. And, and he does, it's not like he doesn't take care of us in the promised land, but the wilderness is that season of pruning, that season of strengthening, that season of the Lord. He, his, he takes care of his people by the manna. Their shoes didn't dry out. Their shoes didn't wear. Their clothes didn't wear. And he took care of them. But once they entered into the promised land, he said, wherever you go, I'll be with you. Remember, Sido taught it. And so we are entering into this day of, I think there may be some people that are um, <clears throat> confused on what God is doing because it doesn't look like what he has done in them in the past. The thing with new territory and pioneering is you are always the first one to see it. The thing with pioneering new territory is you're the first one to go through it and it feels alone and you feel empty. But I believe like even uh, the Lord's been even challenging me personally on me waiting for, waiting for him to speak things to me. And what I've been feeling in my spirit is go. Like I've been feeling this like go you're ready. And I'm here to declare to you guys, go, you're ready. Because the Lord will go with you. His name shall be called Emmanuel, God with us. And so not that I'm not thankful for the years that he provided and the wilderness and he held us by the hand, but I am looking forward to overcoming some things now. And he says, wherever you go, I'll go with you. I'll be your strength. I'll be your rear guard. I'll be your shield and your buckler. Amen. And so it's important that we understand how that process of entering the promised land takes place. Remember when, when the children of Israel crossed the Jordan, the priests stood in the midst of the Jordan. So I want, I want to kind of give you guys a picture of this. They stood in the midst of the Jordan, bearing the glory of God. How many of you ever read this? Joshua chapter six. And so Joshua said to them, step in the water. And as soon as you step into the water, it, it'll split. And the priests, seven priests stood in the Jordan carrying, which I'm sure was a very heavy box called the Ark of the Covenant, as the entire multitude of the children of Israel crossed the Jordan. The last person gets across the Jordan and they can't just, oh, thank God we're done. Joshua says, I have a great idea. Let's take some memorial stones. How many of you remember that? Joshua chapter four. And we're gonna put some memorial stones in the Jordan so generations, generations from now, people would remember what God did among the children of Israel. So through the people crossing the Jordan and through this whole time of setting up the memorial stones, the priests are standing, carrying the glory. And I believe in 2024, God's gonna require us to stand in every situation, carrying his glory. And this is a Levitical priesthood 
type of house. Our house is not a house of spectators. Not that everyone will, will preach, not that everyone will lead prayer rooms, but I believe that God is changing the paradigm of what church is, and he's inviting everyone to come into this priesthood experience. A kingdom of kings and priests. And so a kingdom of kings and priests have a higher calling than the people of Israel. And they have a higher authority, a higher responsibility. And so as the people of Israel, see Joshua just said, watch the priests and follow them. As long as you see the ark, go where that goes. That's all they had to do. Follow the pillar of cloud, the pillar of fire, follow the ark. They're sheep. That's all they had to do. Just follow. It's really easy. And the, the children of Israel were allowed to go walk over and go start in, going to their territories with their children and their families as a priesthood was standing. As a priesthood was standing in the Jordan. And so sometimes we go through things and I believe that God is showing us that we're in a season of standing. And so it's so important that we don't compare ourselves to others. It's so important that we don't compare ourselves to our neighbors and our friends because I believe that God is calling a priesthood higher that are gonna stand in the gap for the people of God. So judgment starts in the house of God. So what God is going to do in his body, he's gonna do it first in the priesthood. And what God is gonna do in the earth, he's first gonna do in you. Amen? Everything in the kingdom of God, and we're going to get to James chapter one, must become an inward reality before it can become an outward manifestation. And so I want to get this in our spirit. And I believe before we see the manifestation of it, we have to be a people that believe, say believe, believe who we are, believe who God has called us to be. And so there is a higher responsibility for the priests of the Lord to stand and carry the ark through every circumstance. There is a higher responsibility for a Levitical order, a kingdom of kings and priests that require a unmovable, unchanging type of perspective and personality and perseverance when maybe it seems like it's going smoothly and easily for the world and for everybody else. But there is a stand that's required. I said, there's a stand that's required. And so I believe in this season, the Lord is inviting all of Risen Nation Church and all of those that are connected to us to this priesthood, but it's gonna take strong shoulders. I said, it's gonna take strong shoulders. But we have to allow the Lord, allow the Holy Spirit to work in us before he's gonna work out of us. Because I believe we are coming into a season where what has been worked in is about to be worked out. What has been worked in is about to be worked out. So whatever the Lord is going to do in the earth, he's going to do in you first. And so this is why sometimes like we feel like, man, what is going on? Like, I feel like I'm the only one going through this sort of thing, or the Lord is speaking to me in a certain way and, and what's going on. And he's doing a work in you. And there may be no manifestation of it yet, but he's working in you. We may not see the fruits of it yet, but he's working in you. Let him work in you. I really feel that. I said, let him work in you. Amen. So Philippians 1, 6 says, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Philippians 1, 6. 1, 6 he has begun a good work in you and he will complete it. Say, until the day of Jesus Christ. We are in the day of Jesus Christ. I believe as his body, we are stepping into a season of what has been planted in us is going to begin to be manifest out of us. I believe we are stepping into a season that what God has planted in you is about to be manifest out of you. I'm, I'm inviting everyone into the, into the priesthood. And this should not be uh, cause fear that I'm going to pull somebody up and, and make them preach. Maybe I will. I don't know. I'm going to keep you on your toes. I'm not really even talking about serving from a, a ministry standpoint, even though I believe, I believe that is true for a lot of us. But, but what is God asking us to do? 
with what he has given us, right? So we are stepping into a season of what has been planted in us is going to begin to manifest out of us. Philippians 2, 12, and 13, just write these down, read them later. It says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. And so we are in a season of working out what he has worked in. We are in a season of working out what he has worked in. And so I want us to come up higher tonight. I said, come up higher tonight. There is a higher revelation of walking with Jesus that I want us to see. There is a higher life that he is calling us up to. And not that we've lived bad lives, not that we've lived in disobedience, but it is just a higher revelation that, that takes a responsibility of everyone together. It's a revelation that takes the responsibility of bearing the weight for the person next to you. And I want to step into practically how we do that. James chapter 1. And we're going to start reading in verse 21. You guys there? It says, Therefore lay aside all filthiness, an overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, say implanted, which is able to save your souls. That's your mind, your thinking. Some translations say the engrafted word. That word means to incorporate permanently. Say incorporate permanently. So God's word has been incorporated in us permanently. When I broke my arm in football, there's they put a plate and six screws right here. That is implanted in me. That's permanent. So I can hit you with a metal plate. If it's really hard, it's because it's metal. And I don't let uh, set off the metal detectors in airports for some reason. Uh, <clears throat> but that is the implanted word to incorporate permanently the engrafted, it becomes part of our nature, a permanent part of our thinking. He says, when you receive this with meekness, say meekness, when you receive the word of God, if we receive it for ourselves, believe it for ourselves, it actually becomes a part of us. We actually become the word. I'm going to prove it to you. We actually become the word of God in how we manifest it. Does that make sense? Verse 22, but be doers, say doers, doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. So if you hear the word, but you're not doing the word, you're deceiving yourself. And so a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the righteousness of faith. How many of you remember that? And tonight I want to talk about the works of faith. And that may seem like a contradiction, but you'll see. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty, that's God's word, and continues in it, say continues. It's the word abide, remain, stay. Who remain in the word, he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and is not a forgetful hearer because if you just hear it, you'll forget it. But a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. Say amen. So the word doer, write this down, is the word poet. It's in the Strongs. I'm not making it up. The word poet or author, it's a producer a maker, it's somebody that, that takes action, produces, makes, works something, creates something, that's a poet. So James is saying here, your life should be a poem of the word of God, completely new, unique. You know, when the, when the word says that we will all stand before him and give an account, and people say that as a, a doom and gloom thing, and you're going to have to stand behind somebody and you may be second in line and you're going to hear all their horrible things and the guy behind you is going to hear all your horrible things. What that word actually is, it's, it's the word logos. Say logos. It's not an account as in a, 
I'm going to tattletale. I'm going to confess. It's, there's no, it's not a confession. It's a logos. That is the expression of the word of God. And so Paul is saying, if you are a doer of the word, you're a poet. Your, your life is the poetry of the word, completely unique. Your life should write, be an author of the word of God poetically written and only the way that you can. So I'm going to stand before him and I'm going to give him my poems. I'm going to stand before him and I'm going to give him my expression, my logos, the, the life, everything, the image. He wants to see himself in that moment. Not hear about your sin. He wants to see himself in you. Are you the glory of God? Are you the righteousness of God in me? He's not going to ask you if he sinned. He knows it already. Trust me. And he gave himself for you 2,000 years ago. Like either we're going to start preaching the word of God as it's finished, it's done. Uh, either the blood is enough or it's not. We teach the blood, but then we preach and we think and we talk like there is still some blood to be shed. He shed it all. There is no, he doesn't run to the cross again when someone gets saved. He died once and for all, the word says. So he's after. Where is the word? The word became flesh in a man named Jesus, and he was the firstborn among many brethren. I want the word to be expressed back to me. I want some poetry. Is there any poets in the house? Doers of the word, where I don't only read it, hear it, understand it, but I walk it. It's the poetry of my life. And so John 1.14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, speaking of Jesus. And the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so the word became flesh and dwelt. Say dwelt. That word is tabernacled. And the New King James gets this, this one wrong in this particular verse. Because they put among. As if because Jesus came as a man and he was among men, which is true. The word among is actually the word in. Look it up. I'm not, don't listen to a word I say, just look it up for yourself. And so it should read, and the word became fleshed and tabernacled in us. It changes it, right? So the word became flesh and tabernacled in us, and we beheld his glory. And we say we. And the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. So when the word became flesh, he dwelt, tabernacled, not only, in, not only among us, but in us. And so I pray that this word can become my life, that I become a testament of the word of God. And it's not saying me that, that I do anything, but I, I've died to myself. I've died to my old nature of thinking. I've died to my old life. And I'm not saying that I've attained anything. But until we believe that we can be the word of God in the flesh, we will not advance. Until we believe who this word says we are, we will continue to circulate. And for the, 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 um, uh, for the religious minds, it may be Pharisee. It may be heresy. For those that, uh, that are stuck in religion, that are stuck in whatever someone has taught, it, it may be combated with uh, arguments. But are we going to preach the word of God or not? Are we going to believe the word of God or not? And so what are we doing? This is what I want to get to. What are we doing with the word that has been implanted in us? Because James says, receive with meekness the implanted word. And if Jesus is the word made flesh, then I believe that the word must become flesh in us. If Jesus is the word made flesh, 
The word of God must become flesh. That's what it means to be a doer of the word. Amen? So go to chapter 2. Just one, one chapter over in verse 14. James here is saying, what does it profit my brethren if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food or one of you says to him, to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them which things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Right? We've heard this before. So it's saying... Someone's asking for bread and you're like, I'll pray for you, brother. That's not faith. That, that it doesn't help anything by saying, I can have faith that you're going to have some bread one day. No, give them bread, right? Verse 18 says, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. I love this. James says, show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works? And by works, faith was made perfect. It's a powerful statement. By works, Abraham's faith was made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. Does anyone want to be a friend of God? You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. What Paul said to the Galatians, you're only justified by faith. You're not justified Read Galatians chapter six on your own time. It's so good. <clears throat> I want to talk to you about the difference between the works of the law, which is what Paul was talking about, and the works of faith, which is what James is talking about. So you can never work your way to God. Does that make sense? By, by grace are you saved through faith. It is the gift of God. There is no works that you can get to uh, that you can do to be closer to God, to be accepted by God, to get to God. There is no works that you can do to become righteous. We've learned this, right? We all understand this. But once we get to that place, there is a manifestation of the righteousness of God called good works. And so I'm not talking about works of the faith. I'm, ta I'm not talking about works of the law because works of the law is trying to do something to get to God. I'm talking about works of faith tonight, okay? Are we all on the same page? So you see then that a man is justified by works, not by faith only. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Somebody say amen. All right, turn to Ephesians chapter two. So I'm not talking about works of the law to get to God. I'm talking about stepping into a justification that comes by faith and works together. That's not go trying to get to God, but it's coming from God. And so there should be a manifestation of the working of the ministry if we are going to build a priesthood. And so I want to invite you guys into what does that look like, the working of the ministry and assembling his body together. Is this making sense to anybody? All right, Ephesians chapter two and verse four. But God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, that's unresponsive, made us alive together with Christ I love how it's always together, alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. How many of you remember in Acts chapter three, when it says that heaven will hold Jesus up, 
We've learned this until the restoration of all things. I believe we are coming to the restoration of all things. But the restoration of all things is the word restoration there is true theocracy. It's it, a theocracy is when religious order rules in the earth. So Saudi Arabia would be a theocracy that the, the religious leaders rule and not the political leaders. It's saying that when the sons of God take dominion, heaven's going to hold up Jesus until that time. And so the dominion we lost in the garden, we have been restored to that dominion in Christ Jesus. We've been redeemed to that same dominion, that same authority and that same power, but it's gonna require the together with Christ, raised us up together, made us sit, sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So there must be a gathering, assembling of his body for Jesus to return. There must be the perfect church, spotless, without, without spot, without wrinkle, a bride that is adorned for her husband. And so verse seven says that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. I wanna stop and encourage you with something here. When, when we hear people speak, about doom and gloom and how God is angry and how God's going to come and smite and how, and how the, uh, we're going to get caught in all this darkness and all these things. I want to encourage you guys that in the ages to come, the heart of God is that he would show us the exceeding riches of his grace. There is going to be, the word says that there is going to be a, a judgment on the things of this world. There is going to be a reckoning with evil and God is going to judge the, the systems, the Babylon of this world. But I want to encourage you guys that through it all, at the end of everything we go to, he is going to show us the exceeding riches of his grace in kindness toward us that I want you to have this mindset that in the ages to come, it's not going to work worse for me. It's not going to be worse for me. It's not going to be harder for me. It's going to be in his exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness is always toward me. That when the hell and brimstone guy comes and talks about all the evils and all the terrible things and all the calamity, yeah, but in the ages to come, he's going to show me through it all, hell or high water, there may be a difficult seasons, difficult trials, things we have to overcome. But at the end of the story of the plan of the ages is I'm going to show you my grace and my kindness. And it's exceeding. It's more than you could ever hope, imagine, or think. In the ages to come, God's grace is going to be what's displayed. Mark my words, in the ages to come, it's his goodness and his kindness that are gonna call men to repentance. It's his kindness that he's gonna be known for. Not his wrath, it's his kindness. It's his grace in the ages to come, grace for me and my family. In the ages to come, grace for my household. It's not, it's not just wishful thinking. The word comes by faith, it comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. So speak the word of God that when fear comes and doubt comes and insecurity comes, speak the word of God that in the ages to come, he's going to show me his grace. Grace that I couldn't even imagine. Kindness that is beyond comprehension. For by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So I'm not talking about the works as in getting to God, that's works of the law, or works about doing something to make yourself right with God, that's works of the law. But verse 10, here it is, it says, for we are his workmanship, say workmanship. The New Living Translation says, we are his masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus, why? for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So there's works. God not only chose you, but he prepared works for you to walk in beforehand. That you are his masterpiece created in Christ Jesus for good works. And God prepared, that means ordained beforehand that we should walk in them. I want you guys to think about this and go home and study it. 
The Passion Translation of verse 10 says, we have, remember we were talking about poetry, we have become his poetry, a recreated people that will fulfill the destiny he has given each of us. For we are joined to Jesus, the anointed one. Even before we were born, God planned in advance our destiny and the good works we would do to fulfill it. I'm gonna read it again. The Passion Translation, Ephesians 2, verse 10. We have become his poetry, a recreated people that will fulfill the destiny he has given each of us. For we are joined to Jesus, the anointed one. Even before we were born, God planned in advance our destiny and the good works we would do to fulfill it. So God planned your steps, planned your destiny and planned works for you beforehand that we should walk in them. Amen. All right, jump to Ephesians chapter four. And I promise all this is gonna come together but I need us to see the full picture. Ephesians chapter four and verse 11. This is maybe one of my favorite chapters in all of the Bible. And I, I know you guys probably know it by heart for how much I preach it, but we're gonna read it again. And he himself, say he himself. He himself that's of himself, gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. That's for the perfecting of the saints for the work of ministry. For the edification of the body of Christ, that's the building of his body, till we all come to the unity of the faith. Say unity. And of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. This, I believe, is what we are coming to, and this is what is going to be required in, a, in really assembling God's body. It's going to take a unity of faith, not uniformity. There's a difference. I'm not, when I talk about unity, I'm not talking about us being all the same. This is not uniformity. This is unity. But it's where our, where, uh, our functions, our giftings are different that actually unifies us. It's not the uniformity that unifies us. So we are, the, the, the heart of God is that how beautiful, how pleasant it is when brethren dwell together in unity. How many of you remember Psalms 133? So he is bringing us to this place of unity and edifying his body until we all come to the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Verse 14, why? That we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head Christ. So how we grow the body is speak the truth. Are you guys following that? Verse 15, because it says, speak the truth and it may, that we may grow up in all things into him who is the head. Verse 16, key verse, from whom the whole body, say whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Somebody say amen. So the body is joined and knit together by what you supply it. The body is joined and fit together. The word says knit together. That's fit perfectly together. It's built together by what every joint supplies. So I'm here to ask you guys tonight, and I really, I want us to take this to heart, but how are we supplying God's body? Are we supplying the body or are we consuming, taking from the body? Are we supplying to edify or are we, are we uh, being dragged along by what God is doing? Are we spectating or are we building? I pray that every person that is a part of Risen Nation Church is a builder that builds God's body, edifies God's body. And I'm not even talking about 
necessarily the giftings of ministry because it clearly says in verse 11 that he gave some, say some. And so not everyone is gifted necessarily uh, to walk in in uh, a gifting that is, you know, to preach or to worship or whatever it is, but we do all have giftings. And uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 12 says that God gave us the manifestation of the of the spirit to each one for the profit of all. So whatever God gave you is not for you. The gifting is God has given you, the anointing he's given you, the word he's given you, uh, the talents he's given you, all that God has given you is not for you. And preachers really need to hear this. Pastors really need to hear this. It's not for your ministry. It's not even for testimonies. It's not for YouTube. The giftings that God has given you is to build and edify his body. And we have made it about so many other things. And if we have this right perspective that what God has given me is so unique, is so individual, is, is, is my poem from God, like we heard, is so unique that only God can give me. No one else on this earth can supply the body with, with the way I can supply it. There are things that you have that I can never supply the body with. And this is why People ask why we have certain speakers and we've had speakers in the past that uh, we've had to get up here and and we say, you know, we don't really, uh, we love them, but we don't really agree with that. And we've had to kind of correct and, but we'll, we'll have them back. And because I am very aware that there are men and women of God that carry things that the body needs that I can't supply. I am very aware that Todd White's carries something that I don't have. And that's not a detriment to me. That's, that's God assembling his body. And so if we all look the same, if we all talk the same, we'd have one really big, strong arm and no body. And so this is the unity of the faith that maybe I don't agree on every little doctrine. And because we've taken giftings and anointings and and personalities and they're different and we've made denominations based on our differences when our differences should be what unites us. We've made denominations based on giftings when the different giftings are should be what edifies the body and the body's in shambles because we've made it about ministry, giftings and callings and we've made uh, ministries about one man's gifting and one man's anointing when God is calling a priesthood to assemble a body to finally carry his head. The foxes have their holes, the bird has their nest, the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. It wasn't because Jesus was poor. He has nowhere, no body to put his head on. That he may rule in the earth. How is he going to rule in the earth? He's not going to have a golden throne on Washington, D.C. How is Jesus going to rule in the earth? Through you. The kingdom of God is in you. It doesn't come by observation. It's in you. Until we believe that the kingdom is here and it's in me, nothing will change. Until we believe that the kingdom of God is in me, we won't be able to do the works of the faith that the body needs. The works of the ministry. And so instead of being nervous, instead of being shy, instead of having false humility, it's actually, we need to have the posture of, I am not supplying No, I don't, I don't want to pray. I want to, be, I want to be humble. Let someone else do it. I don't want to lead prayer. Let somebody else do it. I, I, don't, want to, I don't want to serve. Let, let someone else do it. I'm just, going to come, I'm just going to come and watch, and I'm going to leave five minutes before service over so I don't talk to anybody. I'm going to show up at, at, 10, at 1045 so I can miss a little bit of worship so we can get, we can get to the word. We got to tighten up. If we're going to advance in the kingdom, if we're going to, if his kingdom is going to be revealed and manifest through our lives, if we are truly going to be a priesthood, a kingdom of kings and priests, this Levitical order, we have to get back into order. We have to get back into shape of why we are here. Why has God called you? Why has God gifted you? Why has God anointed you? And yes, there may be seasons of, of I, I need to be alone with God right now. And there, there may be seasons of, I need God to speak to me and all that. And that's fine, as long as it stays a season. But there must be a time where you open your mouth 
I said, open your mouth, speaking the truth in love that we may all grow into our head, Jesus Christ. So his body is not being supplied by people who want to watch. His body is not being built by spectators that should be building. I'm not saying that's you, but you know, if the shoe fits, it's all right. What does Todd say? Kick it off. <clears throat> but we are gifted, anointed, ordained of God for a specific working, a specific task that grows. Paul calls it the work of the ministry, the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come to this unification of faith. It's not unification of doctrine. It's not unification of word. It's not unification of belief system and, and uniformity of how we do things. It's unity of the faith, that we have the same faith by what every joint supplies. Somebody say amen. And then the key to it all is it causes the growth of the body for the edifying. It causes the building of the body and what builds his body is love. What assembles his body at the end of the day, what should drive us is love. At the end of the day, our pursuit should not be, I'm going to supply the body when I feel most anointed. It's I love the person next to me. I love the person that I'm serving under. I love the team that I serve with. I love my leaders. I love my pastor. I love my uh, the teachers. I love the people that teach my children. And I'm going to supply out of love. This is how the body is built. Love is the glue of God's body. I said, love is the glue of God's body. And so this is the motivation. It's not so we can build something and there are the prophetic word that over our life that we are gonna preach to multitudes can come, can come to fruition. And it's not so we can do anything. It's the love that I have for my friend. The word says no greater love than this, that one would lay down his life for a friend. That's, that is a powerful statement. And so we're really good. No, if you can help me wherever you are. We're really good at loving Jesus. We got that down. Somebody say amen. amen. Praise God. We, we, uh, we love Jesus in this house beyond the shadow of a doubt. That's obvious. But how are we loving his body? It's the only message that I want to preach tonight. <clears throat> the works that Jesus created for you in Ephesians 2.10, preordained works that you should walk in them. Are we walking in them? And it's okay if you're not. I'm, this is not to condemn anybody. This is to bring us up higher that there's a responsibility that I need help carrying this thing. This is not the works of the law. These are works of faith. Works can never take the place of knowing him, but once we know him, the works will automatically manifest. Does that make sense? Remember when he said Lord, the the these uh, Pharisees and people came up to him and said, Lord, we've done all these things as followers. We've done all these things in your name. We've cast out demons in your name. We've done all these things. And he says, get away from me, workers of iniquity. I never knew you. I mean, you remember that in Matthew chapter seven. And so it's not working to know him, but it's working from him. It's a manifestation of abiding. So turn to John 15 and, and I'm almost done. I hope we're all catching, catching this. John 15, verse four. This is, this is the posture. We have to abide in him because there's no abiding, there's no working, there's no fruit unless we are attached to the vine, right? And so everything we do is not to work for work's sake, but it is a manifestation of our union with him. And so if we want our love for our neighbor, for the person next to us to grow, if we want to be able to supply the body, it's so imperative that we abide in the vine, that we continue, that everything we do, every, every part of our ministry, every part of our life, every part of our thinking, every part of what we do on this earth must come up from a place of our unity with Jesus. 
That verse, verse four of chapter 15, it says, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, verse seven, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit. He's glorified by the fruit that you bear. So you will be my disciples. His disciples must bear fruit. If you abide in him, you will bear fruit. And so there is, it's okay to have seasons of, I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to find the Lord. I'm going to be with the Lord and that's fine. But if you are really with the Lord, there will be fruit from that. As the Father loved me, and also I loved you, abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another. This is the main thing I want to talk to you guys about tonight, and it's the probably most taught thing in Christianity but it is the most misunderstood thing. And it is the most powerful thing that we have. The most powerful ability is to love one another. He says, this is my commandment that you love one another. As I have loved you, greater love has no man than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. What has God commanded you? I'm asking you. Write it down. Let the Lord speak to you. What has he commanded you? No longer do I call you servants, but a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the father in my name, he may give you. These things I command you, that you love one another say love one another. So I pray tonight that our love for one another grows. And the manifestation of that love is a supplying, is a pouring into the body like we haven't done before. And, I, and I, I'm not talking about striving and just doing things for work's sake, but I, I believe that if we pray into, there is something locked up in each and every one of you that's incredible. There is something locked up and what is going to release that is when we begin to love. The love outpouring releases what we supply to our neighbor. Does that make sense? And so there are, there are times when I've been praying for people and, and prophesying and laying hands on people at, at other churches, conferences, whatever, and I don't know them. And, and the Lord is there and he's merciful and he's faithful and, and the Holy Spirit is speaking and, you know, I'm operating in the gifts and it's wonderful. But as soon as I come to somebody that I really love, it's like the fire of God. I've had anybody ever experienced this with like a family and I can't even talk and I can't, I can't hold myself. And so it's the love that, that, burns in us, that causes us, that I want to give whatever I can to whatever this person needs. I want to be whatever this person is lacking and make up the difference in their life. This is what a priesthood is. It's carrying the glory above the dirt and the crap of the earth, not pushing it through, but carrying it on. Let me take the burden. Let me take the responsibility. Let me supply because of my overflowing love for you. I really love you guys. I said, I really love you guys. And I pray that the love of God in us would increase for the person sitting to the left or to the right of us. It's a super practical, and this is not like blow your head off message, but we need to understand God's word. We need to understand what grows his body. Amen. So to assemble his body is to love his body and to love his body is to supply it. To assemble his body 
is to love his body and to love his body is to supply his body. In other words, how do you assemble his body? You love. And how do you love his body? Supply. It's the best way to love. How do you assemble his body? You love it. And how do you love it? Supply it. So if you don't know what to do, you don't feel that love I'm talking about bubbling out, begin to supply. That's how you love. Begin to serve. That's how you love. Begin to encourage. That's how you love. The word that's God's given you for your neighbor, give it to them. Begin to love. That's how you love. Begin to serve. Begin to work in the back background. Begin to take on responsibility and weight that no one may ever see but the body is going to be edified by it. The body is going to be held by it. The glory of God is going to be carried by it. Is anyone hearing this? Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23 and 24, it says, let us consider one another to stir up, or let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Colossians chapter three, and, and we won't turn there for time, but Colossians chapter three and verse 14 says, to put on love, which is the bond of perfection. The bond is glue. So we have to put on love because it glues. It's the bond of completion of his body. So I want to ask you guys, we know how to love Jesus well, but are we loving his body well? And sometimes I've witnessed as a pastor, not just here in a lot of places where we confess Jesus and we're up here at the front, we're crying during worship and the works and the acts and the deeds that we are doing does not reflect that same love. And I'm believing that God raise up a generation whether they are kings in the marketplace or priests in the church, but a generation that walks in love, a generation that walks with integrity, a generation that when we are doing business dealings in the business world, we have the most integrity, the most integrity. And it's not like, you know, there's so many stories I've heard of people not wanting to work with Christians because Christians are the hardest to work with. And we're not being the light of the world to anybody. That's not walking in love. And we're make, we make people run away from the house of God instead of run to it. So how are we loving his body as you stand to your feet? So there is something that is locked up in each and every one of us that I am praying tonight that begin to be released. Amen. There is giftings, anointings, power, working of the ministry, I believe, that, that is about to be released into our community, that is about to be released into our families, that is about to be released into our schools and into our workplace. Amen. And I believe that as we strengthen God's body and love one another, like really truly love one another and the bond of perfection, which is love, truly begins to be manifest, I believe that we are gonna experience God in a greater way than we've ever experienced Him. That we are gonna experience the Holy Spirit in demonstration and power in a greater way because when His body is assembled, the head will come. I said, when His body is assembled, the head will come. Listen, judgment begins in the house of God. So for us to change it out here, we have to work on what's in here. For the world to change out there, what's in here has to be in order. And it is, the church at large is so out of order. And so if you read Revelation chapter one, just read Revelation one through three on your own time when you get home, read about the churches. And the angel of the Lord, John said, I was caught up in the Lord's day and I heard a voice behind me like a trumpet. How many of you remember in Revelation chapter one? If you follow the progression of Revelation and it says he turned to see the voice and the first thing he saw 
was a golden lampstand. So at the beginning of Revelation, the beginning of the revelation of Jesus Christ, the first thing John sees is the golden lampstand, which is the church. So the angel of the Lord is saying, before the revelation of Jesus Christ, I need to set things some order in the church. Are you guys with me? Before the revelation of Jesus Christ, before all the other chapters and visions and all that, let's set some things in the order in the church. The golden lampstand is the church. And it says, and one like unto the son of man in the church. And so I believe that the revelation of Jesus Christ is gonna come in you and me. I believe the revelation, the manifestation of his kingdom is gonna be manifest in a people that are assembling the body of Christ. Many members, and we are members of his body in particular called Christ. So we've learned that Christ is in his last name, but it is a many membered body. So the first thing before we see more revelation, before we see more manifestation, before we see more miracle and before we experience him more, because how many of you have, have seen that we have cycles and seasons in God and we'll have seasons of miracles and healing. We'll have seasons of, of deliverance. We'll have seasons and powerful revivals and moves of God. And it all comes back around until there is a body. I can't, I can't stress this enough until there is a, an assembling a working of the body that is perfected by love until the love can increase and his body can be assembled the revelation will not come and so John turns and sees the voice speaking to him and it's the church and Jesus in the church so the world has to turn and see Jesus in the church until the world can turn and see Jesus in the church. We will continue to cycle. We will continue to move. We will continue to just keep going around and, and we'll see moves of God, but then it'll fade. But until his body is assembled in a priesthood that can carry the weight. So if you go to chapter two, he talks to the church at Ephesus and he says, you've done all these things. You have patience, you have good works. And I have this one thing against you. How many of you remember in Revelation chapter two, that you've left your first love. And then what does he say? Repent and do the first works that your candlestick won't go out. The purpose of the church is to light up the bread of life. Think about the tabernacle, the purpose of the candlestick. It was on the left side, the showbread was on the right. It lit up the showbread, which is the life of Jesus, the bread of life. He is the bread of life. And so it, he's saying, come back to your first love so that you can continue to shine the light of Jesus. This is our purpose. This should be ministering to you. This is our life. This is our destiny to be the candlestick, but we can't the, the life of Jesus will not be fully lit unless all the candles are lit. The life of Jesus will not be fully manifest until every single candle is lit. So he says to the church of Ephesus, you've done everything great, but I need you to go back to your first love. And I want you guys to study this and don't take my word for it. But we've always taken that, which is true. We preach that, like go back to how you love Jesus in the beginning and, and the intimacy and abiding with him and all that. And all that is true. But he, remember, he's talking to the Ephesians. You read Ephesians chapter one, Paul says, I've heard of your love for all of the saints. And so he's telling the church at Ephesus, go back to your first love. You've done all these things for people, but you left love. And by loving his body, we will love Jesus greater. I said, by loving his body, we will love him greater. So he wasn't telling them you fell out of love with Jesus because the Ephesians were actually a strong church. They were a church of order in history. They, they were a church that went up against a huge goddess named Deanna. They were a church that burned idols and, and did all kinds of crazy things. They loved the Lord. He's saying, you've left this love. That, and Paul said, I've heard about it. So it's something that they had a reputation about. Repent, change the way you think and do the first works again. So whatever that work looks like for you, I wanna encourage you guys to do it. If God's put something on your heart to lead somebody, 
to to invest in somebody, to if God's put to uh, shepherd somebody or to mentor or walk with them, do it. If God's put something on your heart uh, in the business world, I, I I just feel this thing in my spirit like it's time. If God's put a dream on your heart, it's time to step into that. If God has has given you something that you can supply His body with, it's time for the manifestation of that. And so. The angel of the Lord goes to John and he gives him all seven churches, the letter, the theme throughout the whole thing that he says to every single church is, I know your works. Read Revelation 1, 2, and 3. I know your works. So the works of faith are extremely important to God and he sees every working. He sees every sacrifice. For those of you that, that do serve, for those of you that, that are here long hours, for those of you that are working the work of the ministry, for those of you that have been faithful mothers at home when, and you feel like you're not getting the time with the Lord that you want because you're serving your, your children, you're serving your family, He knows your works. I said, He knows your works. So He always sees our works. And then Revelation chapter four, it says a door was standing open in heaven and the first voice which i heard was like a trumpet that was the that was the voice of the angel telling him to write these letters to the church and it said come up here and i will show you things which must take place after this someone say after this so it's not until the church of god gets in order that the revelation of jesus christ will come one through three I didn't want to get into it because I don't want to be two hours. One through three is about setting order in the church. First verse of chapter four, after this, I'll show you great things to come. So the revelation of Jesus Christ is contingent on his body assembling. It's contingent on his body coming together. It's contingent on the love you have for one another. Amen. So let's lift our hands. Father, we love you. We are thankful, Lord, that you've assembled us, that you've gathered us together. that you've placed us in your body. I thank you, Lord, that you give us boldness, that you give us boldness, each and every one of us, Lord, that you give us strength and determination, Father, to supply the body with what it needs, that we not hide our light anymore, that of false humility, we not pull back, Lord, on the things that you've given us. But I pray, Father, that the days of single leaders and church full of spectators are over. I thank you, Father, that you are raising a priesthood, a kingdom of kings and priests that will function as kings and priests in the earth, that will bear the weight of your glory, that will supply the body by with what it needs by every joint that supplies that you edify us in love tonight. Come on, agree with me. Edify us in love, God. Increase our love for one another. Increase our love for those that we serve with. Increase our love for our families, for our parents, for our children, for our spouses. Increase our love that we may build your body, assemble your body, edify your body, God, by the outpouring of our love. And we commit to abide in the vine. We commit, Lord, to continue with you, to meet our Father, which is in secret, who is in secret. Close the door behind us, Lord, that everything we do would come from this union. So increase our love, we pray. Come on, lift your hands and tell them, increase my love. Increase my love, Lord, for the body. Increase my love, God, for your children. Give us boldness in the day of judgment, 1 John says, because as he is, so are we in this world. Make us like you in our thinking that we really, really know beyond the shadow of doubt that the word of God is implanted in us. And let that which has been worked in us begin to work out of us in 2024. And that we, when we don't know what's ahead of us, Lord, give us a pioneer mentality and pursuit that we are going to make a way where there hasn't been a way. 
Give us the confidence to know that when we step out into unknown territory, that you are with us, that you will never leave us, and you will never forsake us, that wherever we go, you are there. We love you, Lord. We honor you. We bless your name. Strengthen our love, I pray. Strengthen our unity and our oneness, Lord. In Jesus' name. And all the people of God said amen. Hallelujah. Can we bless God? Come on. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. All right. We love you guys. Uh, no service on Sunday. Be safe. Enjoy the time with your family. We will see you guys Tuesday morning at 6 a.m. And yes, you can watch Sunday morning online. And remember to be faithful with our giving over the weekend. Love you guys. Yes. If anyone needs prayer, our altar team is up here. If you know, want to know Jesus more, if you want to give your life to Jesus, they're here to pray with you for whatever you need. Thank you again for joining us for this podcast. We pray that above all, your life was touched by his presence. If you're interested in learning more about the church or getting plugged in, you can visit us at www.risennation.org or follow us on social media to stay up to date with all that God is doing here. We love you guys. God bless.